Well, hello, man of family. It's been a while since we have done some uh, interviews with, with some of our folks and some testimonies, and we want to get back to that in 2021. And I'm really excited for you to meet Josh Wilson. Josh has a very unique uh, story to tell. And uh, Josh is an attorney. And uh, so, Josh, I would like for you just to uh, tell us a little bit about your family and tell us a little bit about what type of law that you practice. I have a, a wife and three children. My wife's name is Christina. I'm very blessed and fortunate to have such a beautiful bride. And three little toddlers, a four-year-old named Ellie, a three-year-old named Noah, and Bristol is, is one. I'm an attorney that practices special, uh, mostly in family law. We represent hurting families to help them get to a place of peace in their life. Uh, we're right here in Raymore, Missouri. Great. And uh, one of the reasons I wanted to interview Josh, uh, Josh has been coming to church here for, for some months now and uh, got to know Josh and, and his wife, Christine, a little bit. And he has an incredible story of the journey uh, that brought him to, to law school, and it's, it's a very interesting journey. And, and so, Josh, I just want to ask you a little bit about that. Uh, you haven't always been an attorney, so uh, you grew up in a Christian home, right? Yes, sir. Uh, tell me a little bit about that, the Christian home that you grew up in. You go to church every Sunday? We went to church uh, most every Sunday and grew up in Assembly of God mostly. Uh, I have a praying mom, and, and she's always been there praying for her children to know the Lord. And I believe that is the reason why I, I serve Jesus now, is Amen. being raised the way I was raised. Amen. So you go through high school, and then tell us a little bit of, well, I'm just going to let you tell a story and not ask questions. And I may um, interrupt from time to time uh, just to highlight something or clarification. Tell us about your journey from basically high school after high school to become an attorney? Well, um, there was no after high school because I didn't make it all the way. Okay, so you didn't graduate from high school. I didn't graduate from high school. I That's fascinating out. in itself to me that you're an attorney and because mm -hmm. I know the rigors of law school. As you know, my son's an attorney and I know the rigors and having not graduated from high school. That's amazing in itself, but go ahead. Um, and it is amazing and I'm really humbled by that fact because I'll tell you, I have been confronted with fear and doubt the entire time. Um, I was somewhat of a rebellious child and believed in doing things my way. Mm -hmm. um, didn't really do well with authority in school. So in ninth grade, I dropped out um, against my parents' wishes. And uh, I thought back then, if I could make 100 bucks a day, why? Why? Why go to school? I can do that now. As a ninth grader, you're yes. thinking, that. yeah, wow. And for a ninth grader, that is kind of impressive back then, I sure, guess. Sure, sure. But I uh, learned quickly that that's not really the way it works. I got my GED and didn't do much after that. Um, I drank alcohol, partied, smoked weed. And then on my 18th birthday, living with my mom, raising a ruckus for my mom, being very disrespectful, I remember laying in the bathtub on my 18th birthday and reflecting on my life, thinking, you're supposed to be a man. You're supposed to be an adult. Mm -hmm. Look at you. Mm -hmm. And I instantly, in that moment, said, I'm joining the military. That's hmm. the only quick fix okay. that I could do. Okay. So I joined the uh, military. I got out of the bathtub, told my mom she was ecstatic. Yeah. Which, which branch? <laughs> uh, the yeah. Navy. Navy, okay. Um, I wanted to fly airplanes, and they, can, they had the best sales pitch on flying airplanes. Okay. Didn't fly airplanes in the Navy. Did become a pilot later. Um, my mom was ecstatic to get me out of the house and to get some, some discipline in my life. Uh, still didn't really believe in myself, uh, but went ahead and did that to get to the next step. Got out of the military and got a job in California as a general uh, a superintendent for a general contractor. Not knowing that there was anything special or anything about that, I knew that working like I was seven days a week, 10 to 14 hour days, was not what I wanted. But in doing so in Hollywood, Los Angeles area, I was introduced to methamphetamine mm -hmm. and uh, didn't really even know much about what it was. A guy served it up to me in a Gatorade bottle mm. and quickly became addicted. And obviously I lost my job. They can't do that for very long and keep a job. Mm -hmm. 
And um, that began a downward spiral um, that when I finally quit using meth, it was about a year and my mom was tormented. Um, and she, she says that she prayed daily and used a picture of me from when I was innocent as a baby to just focus on that, mm. to focus on the way that she saw me then. And uh, I had some really close calls. Mm. Um, there's some really close calls. That I, sh I could have been in prison. I could have not been an attorney. Yeah. Can, can I just stop you there? Because I'm curious. So at the time you're doing meth, um, what, was there any time in that period where you said, man, I've got to draw closer to the Lord or, or was the Lord speaking in your heart or were you, you didn't want to hear that or how, how did that work, your relationship with the Lord at the time? The relationship with the Lord and meth doesn't coexist. Actually, the only thing I can really remember about thinking about the Lord was the scripture of blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Hmm. Um, and I remember thinking, is it even true and doubting the Lord? Um, I believe, and there's some people that have said that methamphetamine leads to like sorcery and demonic spirits. And I believe that with the paranoia that gets, that mm -hmm. gets inside someone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I've known people that have actually gone to psych wards. Um, so I, I, I resisted anything. My mom telling me she was praying for me, I would tell her, get Push away, oh, okay. get away from okay. me. Is, is part of that, Josh, because you're, you're, you're so focused is getting that next high, that next fix? I think it was probably conviction. Okay. Knowing that I want that next high, next fix, mm -hmm. and what I should do is probably surrender. I knew right mm -hmm. from wrong, Yeah. and that's why I wanted to not hear that because the sin that I was trying to prioritize didn't coexist with living life yeah. the way I should live. Yeah. Let me just stop here, and I, and I, I want to look in the camera and talk to Manna. This is, in my, man, mom's name is Jewel. Thank, thank goodness for Jewel and dad that did she teach Josh right from wrong uh, and did teach biblical principles because no matter what happens, and, and of course the prodigal son is, is all about this, the, the story. The prodigal son knew right from wrong. Father had taught him right from wrong. Um, and just like Jewel, the prodigal son, father, praying for his son. Uh, his son obviously says, hey, I can do better. I'm going to go out here. And he gets in all kinds of lifestyle just like Josh is talking about. And he finds himself in the pig pen one day, literally sleeping with the, pi the pigs and the slop. And he says, as an awakening, says, oh, my goodness. <laughs> in my father's house. <laughs> It wasn't like this, and I'm going to go back to my father, and I'm going to, going to repent. None of that could have happened if he wasn't taught biblical values. And, and so never underestimate, and I, and I want to talk to the parents here, never underestimate the value of bringing your kids to church, the value you have in teaching them, and then allowing the church also uh, to teach them biblical values and, and biblical stories. There are no guarantees for anybody in life and parents. And I tell parents this all the time. There's no guarantees once we get to the age where we can make up our mind. Um, in fact, the proverb says, train up a child in the way they should go and they won't depart from it. Some interpret that as, well, if you just train them up properly, you'll never have any problems with them, and they'll just automatically. That's not what it means. It means to train them up in the, their bent, in their natural personality. But what it does mean when it says train up a child in the way sh they should go and they should not depart from it, you can depart from it because your parents taught that. It's in your head. It's in your heart. And when those rough times come, it's still, still there. Even in meth, it was still there. And so I'm sorry, I just had to point that out. And so now um, you're at a point where you're having, it's a spiritual battle. So tell us a little bit more about that spiritual battle that you're fighting at this time. I didn't realize that's what it was at the time, right? Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I resisted pretty much anything. I remember one time specifically 
My mom told me, you're going to be very successful someday. And I didn't want to hear that. Mm -hmm. I told her, get out of here. Hmm. I was able to continue to have a relationship with my father. Um, you know, they made sure that they kept something in there. So my father would come to my bus. I lived on a bus. I had guns everywhere. And it was probably a pretty scary place for my dad to come and visit me. Um, but I would allow him to come because he didn't try to give me correction. He didn't mm -hmm. try to, he just mm -hmm. tried to be there mm -hmm. and not correct me. And so that was good because I kept the family ties. Um, you know, the Lord was so present looking back. And it was really hard for me even to call this a testimony because there was never a day that I said, Lord, help me get off a of meth. Hmm. And I began thinking, well, you're not being genuine to call it a testimony if you didn't seek God to get off the meth. Hmm. Okay. But now I actually 100% believe and know that it was God Amen. that protected me the whole time. There was a time, now I was transporting meth from California to Arkansas. Um, took some big risks. One time I was in Eureka Springs going around a really sharp corner and had, no matter how much meth you can do, you eventually go to sleep. Mm -hmm. And my wheels crossed over the center line, going off a cliff, but my mind woke up. And I put that car on two wheels to make it around that corner. That was the Lord hmm. that woke yeah. me up. Amen. And then getting off of meth, I quit cold turkey. I quit immediately, and people ask, like, how do you do it? I had a guy call me actually yesterday. Um, he has a friend, his brother's dealing with it, and wants to know some mm -hmm. secrets. I said, well... Mm -hmm. Man, I didn't do it like most people. Yeah, I ended yeah. up quitting. So what, what was the catalyst that you just finally said, I've, I've had enough of this, I, I want to get off this? I had always known that it's not a retirement plan. Mm -hmm. um, even though in the midst of my, my battles, I knew that you either get killed, you get caught, or you, you die, you overdose or you die prematurely. I, there's, there's no, I'm going to live the rest of my life like this. Mm -hmm. Um, and because of the situation with me going back and forth and getting it from California, I ended up owing somebody a bunch of money and couldn't do that anymore. But really, I had a family that loved me and supported me and welcomed Amen. me back in. Amen. And uh, I was, I was uh, two weeks off of meth, and I went to Las Vegas with my grandmother to go see my sister's wedding. Um, and she made me take out the piercings in my face and my ears and my tongue and my eyebrow. That was the beginning of it. And the whole way, my grandmother talked to me about success and things, and, and I'm just thinking I'm going to have to go back and start from the bottom and work at $10 an hour in construction because that's all I've really ever known. Mm -hmm. And um, we got back from Vegas and went to go pick up my grandmother's dog in Pittsburgh, Kansas, or my cousin's house, and um, him and a group of guys convinced me to go to college because it was easy and fun and a mm -hmm. good time. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, I'm too stupid. <laughs> I've never read a book in my life. I can't go to college. I'm a dropout from high school. There's no way. But they, they, they pushed me. And this is more family members that are pushing mm -hmm. me in the right direction. Mm -hmm. So I said, fine. Anything besides working for 10 bucks an hour and going back. You know, I, I was, when I was on meth, I was selling it. I was making money. To go and do that was really, really uh, difficult for me. So I began going to school and still struggled with partying and believing in myself and mm -hmm. Um, but the first semester I did okay. And then I began thinking, what if I tried? And I tried a little harder. Mm -hmm. Then I began believing in myself more. And there was ups and downs going through college of not believing in myself. Sure. And, but having a family that loved me and believed in me and prayed for me is what I think saw me to the end. Because when I was down and didn't believe in myself, others did. Yes. Yes. And, um, <coughs> I believe the Lord had, had a purpose for my life, like he does everyone's. Mm -hmm. But I can see it because I've, I've also been very, 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 very close to going to jail. Yeah. I've, had, uh, I've had police officers in my car with their nose this far away from things, from uh, things that would lock me up in jail for a very long time. And uh, the police officer, my mom's an emergency room nurse, and so he finds out, makes a connection, who I am mm -hmm. and stuff. And lo and behold, tells my mom, he's a pretty good young man. Hmm. And I had meth in the car, guns in the car. Hmm. And I think that's the Lord, because where does that come from? Where does goodness come from sure. in the midst of that sure. kind of darkness? Sure, yeah. So, so you, did, you made it through college. Um, all the professions you could go into, 
Um, I'm just wondering why you chose law. Um, that's pretty interesting also because of, it's because of my, the meth experience and my rebellion against authority mm. made me think that I could be a professional rebel, rebellion <laughs> type person. <laughs> and, uh, and so rebellion was the, really the original thing uh, that made me want to go do that. And back when the OJ trial was on, that's when I kind of first got experience with what lawyers were. Also, I had my, my parents raised me to never fight. My dad was forced to fight as a young man mm -hmm. to prove his masculinity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he raised me to never fight. And I always felt weak. Mm -hmm. I felt inferior. Mm -hmm. I felt like mm -hmm. I wasn't masculine. Mm -hmm. I've learned all about that. And I'm so thankful my dad raised me that way yeah. now. Yeah. But uh, I thought I wanted to fight with my mind to mm -hmm. prove my value. Sure. Um, and that's what began the desire. Now, as I grew and I grew emotionally and I grew through education, mm -hmm. that all changes. Sure. And I, I'm, sure. I'm not that way. But that's really what started it. Yeah. I just think this is fascinating. I mean, you you go from dropping out of high school <laughs> to have the experience you have and then go to law school. Uh, obviously, God's hand uh, was in this. Uh, a lot of prayer was in it. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> you, you, uh, that is not a COVID cough. It's all sinus, <laughs> trust me. <laughs> uh, you accepted Christ. I think we talked about this. You accepted Christ as a young man, right? Yes. So, so the Lord was with you. Um, you knew him as your Savior, and, and you're his child. When, when we accept Christ as our personal Savior, we become his child. Uh, the Bible says as many as received him, they gain the right to become his children. And uh, so you're his child. Um, he did have your back all that time because you belonged to him. And uh, I, I'm really curious, Josh, and you may not be ready to answer this question, and you don't have to if you don't want to. Uh, you, you mentioned a couple of times that, that you felt that you didn't measure up or you felt emasculated or, or whatever. Have you identified where those feelings came from and where those thoughts came from? Were you bullied as a kid? Or was that something that you just brought on or was that something that someone else projected onto you and how did you eventually overcome that? And today do you feel as if you're precious on the side of the Lord and worth something to Him? I'm really glad you asked that question because um, it's something I'm really passionate about. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that it's similar for other people as it is was for me on why I felt that way. I think it's because society pressures and the way that society projects the image of a masculine man. Mm -hmm. What I believe and what I found out is that the, the, the feeling of becoming a real masculine man, the secret is understanding your feelings, your emotions, mm -hmm. which is so counterintuitive to what society teaches. Absolutely. And the way I got there was another, another mistake. Um, went out with my cousin one night in college. Um, I was older. I'd been through the party days. I did not go do the party until 1, 2 a.m. stuff, but they would always want me to come, but I'm going to bed at 10 o'clock. <laughs> and so I was out car sleeping. And um, he drives home. He gets upset with me because he sees a cop. He's blaming me that he's going to get pulled over because I was sleeping in the car. He's going to get a deal by eye. Well, that really made me mad because I did nothing wrong. Mm -hmm. The feeling of being misportrayed mm -hmm. and being blamed. Mm -hmm. So I get out of the car, I'm going to walk home. The whole way I talk to myself, that, that self-talk, which is, I learned is so important. I didn't realize it back then, but I, I understand now how important self-talk is. And I was like, I'm going to beat him up. I'm going to beat him up. I'm, that guy, I did nothing wrong. He's drinking and driving, not me. Mm -hmm. And so I walked in and I, I went in there and got, and he's always stronger than me anyways, but I scared him. He called the police. And in order to make the charges go away, I had to go do this program. And I thought this was the dumbest program in the world. Until one day, a lady was in this program. And it's a group therapy program uh, for alternatives to battering. It's for mostly men who have been abusive to women. And I'm like, I have never hit a woman. Mm -hmm. So that made me even more rebellious. <clears throat> but then this lady was in there, and she was not taking accountability for knocking her child upside the head with a remote control for not doing her laundry at eight years old. Mm. And I said... Do I sound that stupid? <laughs> because I need to look at myself yeah, if so. Yeah, yeah. And that began me 
starting to listen and pay mm -hmm. attention. Mm -hmm. And then the other breaking point was once I made that step, the other step was as I put 50 cents in a vending machine at the college dormitory and it got stuck, my Skittles got stuck falling out. So I began to shake it just a little bit as I think any reasonable person would. Right. And uh, this young man with purple hair comes out. He's the cop or whatever. He's the resident hall assembly attendant, whatever they call those guys. And says, you better stop it now. I'm calling the police. And man, inside, I didn't react. Sure. I didn't do anything. I sure. did stop. But inside, I was so angry. I was furious. And so I go back to the program a week or so later, and I said, hey, I've got something. Because we all had an opportunity to check in and share what's going mm -hmm. on. Why did I get so angry over 50 cents? Yeah. And then I really believed it was that simple. Why 50 cents? Mm -hmm. And it had nothing to do with 50 cents. It had right. to do with power control and rebellion and authority. Um, that was the beginning of it. I completed that program, which was six months, and they asked me to stay on because I did very well. Mm -hmm. They asked me to stay on as a co-facilitator, so mm -hmm. I did it for three years. Okay. And that's when I really grew. Sure. Was helping other men. Sure. Great. And so um, that's how I began to really feel, and when, that's when I began to feel like a man, yeah. is when I started understanding some of those things that I feel, some of this doubt, it's kind of normal. It's the way we talk yeah, to I, ourselves. I, well, you're so right, Josh, and you mentioned counterintuitive, Christianity is counterintuitive to everything we've been taught, especially for men. When, we're at, when are we at our strongest? When we're at our weakest. <laughs> Those that are weak, he makes mm -hmm. strong. And it's because it, it, it's at our weakest moments that we really realize the source of power. Right. It's not us. It, it is God. And, and when we acknowledge that as men, that there is a power stronger, greater than us. Um, if someone offends us, what are we to do? Turn the other cheek. That's counterintuitive. Just like you said, our natural inclination is we want to pummel them. Right. Um, at the end of the day, for, for, for a man, uh, well, you heard me mention it in, in our men's Bible study yesterday morning that inside of every man, and I don't care how old you are, there's a little boy yeah. that's wanting to know they matter, wanting to know that they're loved, and I think to some degree when we don't feel that, then we have to prove our manhood. And the counterintuitive with Christianity is, is that once we realize God's power, once we realize how much he loves us, that's all we need. Um, when we seek his approval, as Matthew 6, says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Specifically, that verse was talking about clothing and raiment and food. But I also take that to mean all, all these things, right. our, our self-worth, our the, the whole ball of wax. And I, I'm, I'm looking forward to talking to you more about that and you hooking up with uh, Jay Ashball, who has been doing some of our men's group and, and maybe coming up with some classes along those lines. And that's some, we don't script these, so mm -hmm. <laughs> this is all on the spot right now. So, but, but I am looking forward to talking to you I'd love to. Uh, uh, more about that. So I, I want to know now, you, we'll fast forward. Um, you look at your daughters now and what does it mean to you to, to, to know what you've come through and you look at those little daughters and what does that mean to you now as you look at them and know your experience and, and what you now want for them? Um, well, there's a lot. Um, what comes to my mind first is to equip them the best I can so when they make decisions that I disagree with that the truth will resonate in their heart. Mm -hmm. So that even when they don't want to hear it, that it's in them, that yes, seed is yes, in there, yes. that they can discover it again. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in, relevant to this, that's what I think the most. There's a whole lot that my life has, has shaped around, around the way I raise my children, but that's probably the most important. Cool. One last thing. Um, we have 
both men and women in this church that struggle with addictions. Uh, in fact, we have a, a what we call STEPS program that, that will help people with addictions. And, and we know that addictions comes in all kinds of forms. Uh, it's not just drugs and it's not just meth. Uh, but we do have some of our church that are addicted to drugs and alcohol. What advice as we close would you have for them that they really do have a heart's desire? And I, and I know it's hard because someone just asked you that and you said, well, I just quit cold turkey. Um, do you have any advice for them or any encouragement for them? They really do want to stop. Their heart is to stop. Their heart is to serve the Lord. But it, it's got a grip on them and a hold on them. You know, the thing that I ended up telling the person yesterday and that's, that's interesting because I struggled to come up with something to even say, so I wouldn't mm -hmm. even know what to say if mm -hmm. it wasn't for yesterday, um, is I replaced it immediately with something positive that was building me, mm -hmm. something that was valuable, which was going to school. Even though I didn't really want to, I didn't believe that I could, I was old enough to know that I was responsible for myself. It was time I was 23 years old. I can live with mom and dad, <laughs> probably, yeah. but I had to do something. And so, um, and then I, I didn't have any of those friends anymore. Mm -hmm. I didn't have any of those friends or connections at all. Um, those two things, replacing that with something positive that was growth in my life and not having any association with those people, I think that that was key uh, at that time. And having people that believed in me, mm -hmm. surrounding yourself. Mm -hmm. I know not everyone has a family that believes in them. But there are people. I yeah, believe in people. Yeah, One thing I want to add, Pastor, yeah. is that you know how the Lord talks about that He'll turn all things around for His good. Mm -hmm. One of my greatest accomplishments is the fact that I've done this and beaten meth and, and overcome the addiction and become an attorney because in my business, people really appreciate that. Yeah. It makes me more humble and approachable. Sure, sure. I understand. And when I do see the person um, that has, I've been there. Right. right. And I can believe in them. I do yeah, believe because yes. uh, I didn't believe that I had this ability either. I didn't believe that I should even be here. And every day I'm thankful and I'm humbled that, oh, my Lord, Amen. you've given me exceedingly abundantly more than I <laughs> ever could Amen. have dreamed in my Amen. life. Amen. I've got an amazing, beautiful wife. I've got these charming, well-behaved, sweet children. I've got a nice house and a little bit of land, and yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm very thankful. I'm very, very thankful to the Lord, and, uh, and that's why I believe in giving, because the Lord has given me so much. Praise God. So much. Praise God. Well, Josh, uh, I'm very thankful that you and Christine are here and your daughters are here, and, and I, I believe in divine appointments. I believe that as God said he would do, in 1 Corinthians, he would place members in particular in the body. And I, I just know that you're going to touch a lot of people through this interview and even days ahead, going to touch a lot of people. So thank you for sharing your heart. Thank you for being here, and we'll see you in the hood. Thank you, Pastor. Okay.